Welcome, welcome back to Dissecting Dexter. The festive Christmassy kill table here in the in the studio deep in the heart of Yorkshire, England. Where I'm flying solo this week and I'm very excited because it's nearly Christmas! Are you excited? I am. Did I mention? It's nearly here. It's three days away. What is it? Three more sleeps as I record. Probably two by the time you get to hear this. <laughs> it's a busy week and I'm just squeezing in the prep, the note taking and the recording where I can. My, my work saw fit to send me on a, uh, a training course this week with, with some colleagues and uh, it's taken up two of the days which, um, um, well, normally I try and squeeze in a bit of, bit of prep during my lunch hours in the week and, uh, well, it's just kind of fallen by the wayside a little bit, unfortunately. Uh, so I'm a bit behind. Apologies, uh, but hopefully you guys can get to listen to this before episode eight this weekend. Wow, we're so near the end, aren't we? You know, um, I wanted to do something. I wanted to prep something festive uh, with this being the, the Christmas episode. Uh, but I just, I, I wanted to do it. I thought, shall I do a, shall I do a sort of Dexter parody to a Christmas carol, a Christmas song? Uh, what, what, I sort of threw around a few ideas. Um, Dexter Morgan's coming to town. Or uh, Dexter kills with boughs of holly. And uh, my favourite, Violent Night. Thanks, Travis, for that one. Um, unfortunately, that will be the last of my singing you'll hear. Uh, <laughs> probably mercifully so. Um, yeah, so uh, apologies. Uh, there won't be a full version of any of those songs. I shall leave the, um, the parodies to Travis. Uh, but for now, yeah, we're here. We are, well, we're approaching what is probably the, the, the final act of this, this New Blood series. Whew, what a ride it's, uh, what a ride we're enjoying. And it sounds like a lot of people are enjoying it. Um, the news is that the viewing figures, well, it's, it's interesting news about the viewing figures. As far as I understand it, the figures have been rising each week as the series has gone on. Topped off with a series high this week with episode seven. Deadline.com say that it had the biggest Sunday audience for a Showtime series since 2017 when the Shameless Season 8 premiered. Deadline also state that New Blood is Showtime's most watched drama debut of all time and the most watched scripted drama season premiere telecast among all premium networks this year. Which sounds good. <laughs> With audience figures going so well, there are, of course, murmurs of what comes next. Will there be another season? We've speculated it a bit, speculated a bit on this podcast. Sorry, please pardon my dog. She wanted letting out. Where was I? Viewing figures, yes. Showtime president Gary Levine has been cagey when it comes to talking about another season. He says that any talk of more must wait until after the finale. He says, and I quote, see where we are with our stories and our characters. Well, you can read into this as much as you like. It could mean that he's saying that he's trying not to give anything away about how things end. Levine said the series was designed to give the show a proper conclusion. Remember Clyde Phillips saying the ending will blow up the internet? Michael C. Hall has bigged up the ending too. There are bound to be smoke and mirrors. No one involved with the show will want to spoil the conclusion, and I prefer it that way. It allows us free reign to speculate. But if you pushed me, I feel... I, th I think we're going to get something definitive. OK, Let's uh, let's move on. Quick bit of housekeeping. Uh, thanks to uh, my latest Patreons, uh, you awesome people, lovely people, you, <laughs> Sheila Moore, Christina Bailey, and Inga from the Netherlands. Thank you ever so much for uh, becoming a patron and supporting the podcast. And you can too, if you wish, for as little as one pound a month. Go to www.patreon.com/dissectingdexter. Thank you. Okay, let's get into this episode, shall we? 
Dexter New Blood, episode seven, Skin of Her Teeth, written by Cursor Rain and Veronica West, directed by Sanford Bookstaver, original air date, the 19th of December 2021. <laughs> Join our hero soon after the end of the last episode in the cave with Angela. Her manner is cold and obviously she has two valid reasons to be like this. She's simply got him there to make use of his forensic experience. It's a very old crime scene and there's no fresh blood, but it's fun. It's really fun seeing Dexter go into analysis mode. There are quite a few what should we say, uh, flavours, quite a few um, elements in this week's episode that are, that are old school Dexter and just give me the feels for the old days and, and I embrace it, bring it on. <laughs> I think that's what we love, isn't it? We love to get those, um, those tinges of, of nostalgia for the good old days. Uh, so, Iris, we see she's been shot from behind with a rifle, fitting, the way, fitting with the way that we've seen Kurt kill his victims, although we already knew he probably killed Iris. This just further confirms it. There'll be viewers who found it perhaps far-fetched that Dexter would spot the material in her teeth, and I've seen comments online already about this, but I, I think it reasonable that he's there investigating as much as he can, and why wouldn't he check her mouth? There seemed to be quite a bit of yuck in that tooth, though. She must have given her killer a really good bite. Good performance again from Julia Jones here and there was a moment when I thought Dexter was going to say something really sympathetic or comforting to Angela. When we saw, when he saw the bracelet, he gives her a look. Uh, his face, his expression kind of creases, uh, but he just says it, something along the lines of it might be a long shot with the DNA. Angela tells him about her Kurt theory. And of course it fits in with what Dexter already knows. He has a choice here. The junction in the road, as it were. He could keep his cards close to his chest and not tell her about the cabin, maybe kill Kurt himself, or share what he knows, perhaps go some way to earning back her trust. Dexter's still playing catch-up here though, and he doesn't know the extent of what Kurt's up to, like we do. Now he's wondering how many of those missing girls are missing because of Kurt and where the bodies are. Next, I like the breakfast scene. Dexter and Harrison both eating the same way. <laughs> Gluttons. <laughs> like a mirror image across the table from each other. The subject of the job comes up. And of course, if Dexter didn't want him to work there before, he has even more reason now. I guess he couldn't say too much at this point, but there's an opportunity later in the episode when he should have told him, or could have. Dex, uh, Kurt is being implicated in a murder. What better reason? <laughs> Harrison just thinks his dad's being awkward. He needs some help to understand. Not much with Deb this week, but I liked her reply when Dexter says Kurt's probably a murderer, and she says, well, so are you. <laughs> and he's like, well, yeah, fair enough. <laughs> He seems to have made a decision, though, to let Angela and the police take care of it. A sound, rational decision. Well done, Dexter. <laughs> we'll see how long that lasts. I sound cynical there. <laughs> to reinforce his decision, Dexter chooses to clue in Angela about the cabin and what happened with Molly. A bit of a risk, though, given how he found his own way there. But perhaps if they find evidence and that basement room might have been chock full of it, then the focus will be, or should just be on Kurt. But when they get there, Angela's starting to, while, while Angela's starting to consider the possibility uh, that Kurt might be a serial killer, unfortunately, it was no surprise to find that Kurt had already cleared out the place. Despite his childlike tantrums, this was a very wise and composed, sensible decision by Kurt once his secret cabin had been discovered. He'd have been stupid not to. Unfortunately, there doesn't seem to be any physical evidence for Angela to go on. I would have liked them to go and check upstairs though, given that she was so willing to uh, bust the lock 
on the the basement room. Why not? If she's got probable cause to um, to go upstairs as well. Anyway, what we do know, and Dexter knows all too well, is coming out of this scene is that the case is rather flimsy. At school, Harrison approaches Audrey and she's understandably cool towards him. What normal person wouldn't be disturbed by what he did to that wrestler's arm? It was callous and unnecessary and extremely violent and she's obviously very perturbed by it and wants to keep her distance, at least for now. Unfortunately for Harrison, this isolates him a little more. She was someone he'd opened up to, and now it looks like that door's closed. Who's left? Just one person? And it's not Dexter, that's for sure. It reminds me of Anakin Skywalker in the Star Wars prequels as he loses his support network, pushing him further towards the dark side. See? <laughs> Chris in Scotland isn't the only one who can pull a Star Wars reference. <laughs> I enjoyed the tease of Harrison putting on his protective gear. Gloves, boots, a visor. Nice mirror image of his dad back in the day there. He's washing lorries though and not dismembering bodies, thankfully. Dexter can't help but keep an eye on him and you know Harrison won't appreciate it. And he doesn't. And then Kirk comes in and sits opposite Dexter. And I was quite excited when this scene began. I thought, oh, how's this conversation going to go? Adversaries across the table from each other. Not quite De Niro and Pacino, and the conversation could have been longer for my liking, but it was compelling. They have little digs at each other, and Dexter brings up Molly. He really should be careful here. He's played cat and mouse with a killer before, and look at how that turned out. Of course, we discover retrospectively that Kurt knows more in this scene than he's letting on, but everything they're saying is is layered, loaded with meaning. Angela and Logan show up, and they're serious. Looks like the DNA results have come back positive, and Kurt's arrested very publicly. He does a good job of keeping his cool and playing the innocent man as they lead him out of the diner. Molly is beside herself with excitement and she comes bouncing into Angela's office like Tigger from Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> I nearly did a Tigger impression there, <laughs> hence the pause. <laughs> I thought better of it. That's what Mollies do best. <laughs> there, I did it. <laughs> it is Christmas. Um, Molly is all ready with her recorder to start podcasting. <laughs> But Angela's angry that Molly went behind her back to talk to Kurt. Looks like their partnership might be over. She might have talked to Molly about what happened at the cabin, but I guess Angela's just too pissed off right now to entertain a more lengthy conversation. This is the Dissecting Dexter Podcast. That helps me control the chaos. At the truck stop, Harrison's washing down a lorry that's got a Caldwell logo on it. Uh, the driver approaches him and it's the same guy, the same guy that we saw on the CCTV in New York using Matt's credit card, confirming that, De that Kurt must have paid him to make it look like Matt was there. He gives Harrison an envelope for his dad, which is odd. Why would this guy have something for Dexter? And that's something... It's a long bolt or a screw. Looked to me like something you'd get in some Ikea furniture that you'd do up with an Allen key. You know what I mean. <laughs> We've all been there. <laughs> we later find out it's a surgical screw. It looks huge, though. Can you imagine having that inside you? Angela's interview with Kurt was interesting. Very interesting. And uh, a highlight of the episode, definitely. Kurt has to keep calm and maintain his facade of innocence. She catches him lying, though, and he has to adjust his story, thinking on his feet. However, for me, what was significant was when he called her sweetheart. My wife next to me gave a little <gasps> when he did that, and I must admit, I thought, ooh, that little f that facade there is starting to, starting to slip. 
it's not how you want to be addressing the chief of police. And let's be honest, it's not really how you want to be addressing anyone, is it? It's Unless it's, unless it's your partner, I suppose, <laughs> romantic partner. It, it's patronising, it's just something you don't do. But it's a little sign that he's becoming rattled. He pushes back and suggests her job could be at risk here. Angela's not playing any games, though, and credit to her, she does well not to rise to it. Instead, she tells him about the DNA evidence. And that's it. Kurt lawyers up. Then there's a nice moment that evening in the Seneca community, the people coming together to support Iris's mother. It's a brief scene, but I think it's nice how they how they put that in there. It how how the show takes the time, how the show took the time to depict the community being supportive like that. A little nod to um to the cult to the cultural values. I like that. Very respectful to Dexter and he's got to find out more about Kurt and takes a big risk to do so. He creates a diversion which is quite amusing with the sheep but he wants to get the police officers away from the station allowing him to enter and have a conversation with Kurt. It was a fun smart thing to do but tips his hand massively with Kurt. However you can see why he'd want to know what the heck that screw's all about. It's great seeing Clancy Brown and Michael C. Hall facing off through the bars, another highlight of the episode. Dexter means business, while Kurt's all casual and smug. Veiled threats get tossed around. Kurt brings up Harrison. Dexter says how you can never get rid of everything. Something always gets left, gets left behind. And then Kurt plays his trump card and reveals that he knows Matt's body was incinerated. So right back in episode two, when Dexter burned the body, then picked Kurt up, drunk at the, at the tavern, Kurt knew that night, or later that night, or suspected that Dexter killed his son. The screw was left behind in the ashes, in the incinerator. From Kurt's point of view, you can see how the pieces add up to point the finger of suspicion at Dexter. Maybe that CCTV we said we'd never mention again. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Maybe that footage had Kurt thinking a little bit more. Hmm, that profile could be Dexter. He already knew then about the ashes. That little slip up in conversation at Dexter's cabin when he mentioned Matt not driving the boat. All these things adding up in Kurt's head. Then he mentions that titanium doesn't melt. Dexter makes a glib remark and leaves rather quickly. It felt to me like Dexter thought, shit, what does he know that I don't? And he just got out of there. Then he looks up the screws on the internet and the penny drops. We said a few weeks ago, we talked about this. Was Kurt bringing a gift for Harrison? Being nice to him? Just genuinely acknowledging the the heroic thing that he'd done for the school community. Kurt then subsequently supporting Harrison, being friendly to Dexter. Was all that all with a hidden agenda? All of it? We see now, yeah, yeah, it probably was. He had his suspicions early on. The situation has me very, very worried. <laughs> it reminds me a little of season three with Miguel, when it was a case of who gets who first, but more so of season four with Trinity, serial killer versus serial killer. And like I said a minute ago, we know how that turned out. However, at this point, Kurt still doesn't know exactly who he's dealing with. He doesn't know that what Dexter's capable of, that Dexter is a serial killer. I just think this series isn't going to end well at all. Not for Dexter, or probably Harrison either. Dexter, it's interesting, he kind of empathises with Kurt. He's a father too and understands that if, if the situation was reversed, he'd want revenge too. But that doesn't change the facts of this situation that he now finds himself in and he has to, uh, he has to be careful. Something awful about you, Morgan. 
I should have seen it before. The fake smile, the donuts. You don't even walk like a normal person. You glide like a fucking lizard on ice. It's all a fucking act. And I ain't mine. You're listening to Dissecting Dexter. You are one creep, motherfucker. Next day, Kurt's lawyer is there. But Angela feels quite confident that she's got her man. At this point, though, surely the evidence is still a bit thin. The DNA evidence is good, but after all these years, what did they say, 20, is it? After all this time, couldn't a good lawyer in court argue that the sample might have deteriorated and therefore provide a reasonable doubt? Any other evidence is surely circumstantial at best. I couldn't see it getting a guilty verdict. I never thought that this, this, this case looked good. Not from Angela's point of view, in terms of getting a conviction. But then Kurt makes a statement and spins a very interesting story that's a mix of fact and fiction. It explains where his connection to the Runaway song originated, but more importantly, it gives us an insight into where his apparent lack of respect for women, which I'm assuming, but reinforced by him calling Angela's sweetheart. And it, it gives us insight into his desire, where his desire to target women might have come from. His mother left them, left him when he was young, so abandonment issues again. That's a theme this season, isn't it? And perhaps it gave rise to some negative attitude towards women. And then he says his father, who was a, a, a lorry driver, how he used to pick up working girls and beat them. At a very young age, Kurt had to, excuse me, had to become used to his father hurting women. At a very, very impressionable age, abuse and trauma experienced as a child unsupported and unnurtured. We've talked about these things many times on this podcast, haven't we? You can see how all that negativity might start to give rise to Kurt's own negative behaviour. There's always a reason why people behave the way they do. Always. You can trace it back. I believe all the stuff about his mum and dad and his dad beating up prostitutes. But where his story to Angela turns to lies is when he recalls what happened to Iris. We see in flashback that it was Kurt who did it. Seems like he didn't set out to hurt anyone, but for some reason, after Iris runs away from his truck, he apparently panics, rush of blood to the head, I don't know, but he decides to shoot her in the back. I don't really understand why, though. Yes, he's been through some major stuff as a kid, and his dad's awful. But it's not like he'd attacked Iris or anything. He'd not tried to assault her. Iris got pissed off with him when he suggests he takes her back home, which seemed like a pretty decent thing to offer to do. Kurt seems to remember the kind of thing his dad did or does to girls and was concerned for her. Seemed to me that he was actually, yeah, genuinely concerned for her. She gets all crazy at the notion of going back and bites him, which is where we can see that the DNA got in her teeth. Then Kurt makes the choice to get his rifle and shoot her as she runs off. Was he worried she'd go and tell people he'd hurt her or something? Did something just snap in him? I, I couldn't read it from the actor's performance. Anyway, what this does do is back up the suggestion last week that Iris was Kurt's first kill. Well, he then developed his subsequent MO after that, I guess remains to be seen. Perhaps that was the, there was some further, some outside influence that may feed into some of you guys, some of the theories that, that you've been um, sending in about Kurt not acting alone. The story to Angela, though, it throws a very big spanner in the works. The suggestion that it was his father who killed Iris. I believe the DNA between father and son would be very similar and coupled with the age of the sample to begin with, it does present a reasonable doubt, which the DA, having watched Kurt's performance, is concerned about. And so Kurt's cut loose. Angela looks gutted and furious. We see later that she's in no mood to let this go, following her gut again. 
Dexter, meanwhile, assuming Kurt's still in the police cell, breaks into his office at the diner, looking for... something? <laughs> Anything? Interesting touch to have him straight in the picture frame on the wall. That neat monster. <laughs> a little OCD. A fun character beat. He finds an envelope with a cheque for $5,000 to someone called Elric Kane. Dexter doesn't know this, but I'm assuming it's the lorry driver, the same guy using Matt's card in New York. Payment for what's about to happen in the final moment of the episode, perhaps. It's an odd name, Elric Kane. I wondered initially if it was an anagram, but the best I could do was ankle rice. <laughs> so I don't think it's an anagram, but it was a fun diversion for me for about, I don't know, three and a half minutes. <laughs> then on hearing about Kurt's release, Dexter seems to make the decision, I've got to kill him. And with the stakes rising, Angela and Molly meet at the tavern and compare notes. The upshot being that they're now wondering what's up with Jim, getting suspicious about him as well as Kurt. What was a pretty smart move before, eavesdropping on Molly and Kurt last week, now seems set to turn and bite him. At that stage, why would he feel any need to do what he did with the phone? I suppose he could say Kurt had been sniffing around Harrison and he was worried, but with Angela on a roll with trusting her gut, she knows when something smells bad, it probably is bad. She brings up why Jim and Kurt would be sitting in the diner together. Although we know Kurt joined Dexter, not like they'd arranged anything together or Dexter had joined him. But anyway, it all adds up to a big heap of something really stinky and neither of them like it. Kurt's watching them though as they leave the tavern, or more specifically it seems he's watching Molly. He wouldn't be foolish enough to have another go at taking her, would he? Or maybe with what happens at the end with Dexter, he's planning on setting something up and Dexter takes the fall. Last scene of the episode is dark and raises the stakes even more. We said last week that the th threat from that wrestler's teammate would come back at some point, and it does now. Four of them approach Harrison at the diner, ready for a fight, but the look on the leader's face when Harrison swings with the razor blade. He looked terrified. He hadn't banked on that. Dexter springs out of nowhere to stop him. I'm guessing he was lurking around after searching Kurt's office, and this was maybe just a few minutes later, so he was still there. Harrison gets a bit overwhelmed, though. Good work again from Jack Alcott. Harrison admits he's, he's fucked up, and worse still, he says that listening to Molly's podcast unlocked something in his mind, what he thought were nightmares. He now realises... A memories, memories of Rita's murder and Trinity himself. A nice but very brief appearance from John Lithgow, who we know from previous season came back to shoot something for New Blood. I'm guessing this was it, unless we get another flashback later. Harrison could only have been months old at the time, though. Now, I'm no expert, but I didn't think long-term memory kept things, stored things from that young Perhaps an exception might be extreme trauma, but even then, I don't know. I don't know if the memories would be clear, but we talked before about how trauma at that age can leave a permanent mark on someone and give rise to mental health issues later. You've got to feel for Harrison, and Dexter too, seeing this, this devastation in his son. We can look at what happened with Ethan in a slightly different light now. He'd just heard that podcast and had the realisation, the revelation that he witnessed his mother's murder and then Ethan perhaps was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Harrison just lashed out in anger. But in this moment here, Dexter just stands there, barely saying anything. I was a bit frustrated, but maybe he was a bit dumbstruck with, the, with this horrific realisation that actually Harrison does apparently remember everything from what happened. That was one of his biggest fears, wasn't he? Wasn't it? Dexter could have said how Rita's murder affected him and how he hoped for the best for Harrison back then. He said nothing and Harrison shoots off in the car with one of the kids from school. And then Dexter seems to internally make the decision to tell Harrison everything before Kurt's guy grabs him from behind and we cut to credits. Grabbing Dexter at his car outside a busy truck stop on a busy road in broad daylight? 
very risky. Is the plan to simply attack Dexter there and kill him or or something? Or does does he mean to knock him out and take him somewhere for whatever Kurt's planning? These are crazy times, my friends. I have to say, I'm I'm also very worried about Harrison. I can see him doing some real harm to Dexter before we're done. This sense of impending doom is rising within me. This was a good episode. Not up there with episode five or six for me, but it moved things along efficiently and up the stakes as we move into the final act of the series. And like I say, it, it gave me, on, on several occasions, gave me some, some old school Dexter feels. And I, I welcome that with open arms, as I'm sure you do too. Listener feedback. As always, you can get in touch with the podcast via email. The address is dissectingdexter at gmail.com, where you can also send a voicemail recording, as so many of you do. You can also get me on Twitter at dissectdexter or the Facebook page, facebook.com slash dissectingdexter. Shy in Israel has got in touch again. He says episode seven was overall good but had several points of easy or lazy writing. I think we're all a bit post-traumatic after we saw how from season six the series went down, so we are very sensitive to plot holes and afraid it's a sign for the season going in the wrong direction. But trust the show, as you say. I still trust them, for now. According to the Dexter timeline, Harrison was born in April 2009. Rita was murdered in December 2009, so Harrison was six months old. No way can he have vivid memories from that day. With this timeline, in New Blood, Harrison should be around 13. He's obviously at least 16. Kurt's age doesn't fit as well. 25 years ago, when Iris was killed, he was at the age of 35 to 40, not in his early 20s, as he's shown in the flashback. Angela suddenly became a terrible cop, going for a high-profile arrest in public with only 67% chance that it's Kurt's and no other evidence. It serves the plot, but it's easy writing. So Kurt saw Iris, told her it's dangerous outside, and when she runs from him, he accidentally had a sniping rifle, grabbed it and shot her. If that's all the reasoning we're going to get behind Kurt's kills, it's not satisfying. The connection to the song Runaway was also weak. Why did his dad choose this song all the time? I think it would have been more satisfying if the cake Dexter ate at Kurt's place was key lime pie. I really waited for this. Logan can now be exonerated from any suspicion. Well, thanks, Shy. Lots of of points there, some quick-fire points. I think we all agree that they've taken some licence with Harrison's age. He was a few years old when Dexter left, and it's been eight years, I think, since then. So, yes, he should be in his early teens... I I can't account for why they cast someone who is so clearly older, taking nothing away from Jack Olcott's performance, which I'm sure we all agree has been really, really good. Kurt's age. Yes, in the flashback, he looked in his early 20s, didn't he? Mid 20s at the oldest. Let's say Kurt's about 60 now, 25 off 35 and... uh, Sorry, 25 off that is 35. And like you said... No way was he 35 in the flashback. If he did have his own dark urges brought on by childhood trauma, it would surely manifest earlier than 35. Seems like a little slip, but given that they'd written all the scripts before filming began, it's something they could have easily fixed. Personally, I can let this go too. For Angela, I think she can be forgiven for what happened this week. Her whole career has been motivated by what happened to Iris and suddenly she's found her body and thinks she's got her murderer. She's bound to hold on tightly to whatever physical evidence she's got. Kurt and the rifle? I don't know. Maybe he was into hunting back then and just kept it with him. For me, I think we still need to understand how he went from an impulsive kill like that to become a serial killer with a very specific, ritualistic M.O. Maybe that's still to come. For Logan, I agree, it doesn't look like he's complicit in anything dodgy, certainly not based on his behaviour this week. 
he was straight down the middle doing his job. Oh man, that was such a good ending. I gasped. Hi guys, Des here. Just watched episode seven. Oh my god. Ah, so many feelings, so many actions. The noose is tightening. Ah, okay. So many thoughts. Number one, loved the beginning scene where he's doing this forensic search on Iris. And then, oh, Harrison. So the podcast triggered the memory, just like the room of blood triggered the memory. Oh man, I wonder if that was the totality of the John Lithgow cameo. I don't know. Meanwhile, round of applause to everyone who called the screw. Round of applause. Ah, and then Molly. Molly, Molly's ready to do her digging. She's ready to do her deep dive. Oh, and just as Dexter was like getting ready to open up. Ah, oh, once again, the ending was so good. You know, it's funny because I felt like I was so excited for this episode and the first scene was great, but then I kind of felt like the episode began to drag and then it just flew by and then it was just over. So very excited. Ah, oh, they know. The two serial killers know. And what do we know about serial killers? They are methodical, they are practiced, and they are out for blood. So we shall see. Oh man, oh man, oh man, oh man, oh man. I just, just, oh man. Ah, okay, if I have follow-up vibes and thoughts, you will get a second message from me. But for now, that's all. Des out. Bye! Oh, I remembered what else I wanted to say. Yes, the DNA and Kurt blaming daddy. But guess what? DNA does not follow through the father's line. It follows through the mother's line. So take that, society. I don't want to hear any of this. It was definitely my father because anyone who runs forensics, and by the way, anyone following the podcast, if you do run forensics, please science down on us because I love me some forensic files. But anyone who follows forensics will not know that the mitochondrial DNA from the mother is the only way to track a hereditary line. Thank you! Carry on and have a great night. Des out? Unless I can think of a third thing. She didn't. Thanks, Des. Your enthusiasm is truly infectious. <laughs> Your point about the DNA took me by surprise. I just accepted what they told us in the show. And I'm sure, well, you'd, they would. They'd have done their homework to establish if what they were writing was scientifically accurate. We know they brought in an expert on Seneca culture to advise on that aspect of the show. So it would make sense they'd, they'd bring in someone with, with advanced scientific knowledge to advise them on the DNA stuff. Um, just while preparing this podcast, I've read a little bit myself following... Uh, listening to your voicemail and the Y chromosome in fathers and sons are the same but while most of the DNA seems to be inherited from the mother some apparently is inherited from the father too the DNA between father and son would definitely not be identical though for the show I think their point was that there was a 67 percent uh, chance of a match and perhaps that was taking into account the potential differences between father and son. <laughs> it's making my head hurt. <laughs> Try to get my brain around this. So I won't dig any deeper into the science. But like you said, and I open the invitation out there, if any listener out there properly understands this stuff, please, could you just drop us a little line and, and put it in layman's terms so we can understand? In regard to Angela's case, the probability was way too poor to ever get a conviction on this alone, so in the absence of anything else, they had to release Kurt. Thanks again, Des. Seeing Dexter in his forensic glory was awesome. I enjoyed the whole Angela and Dexter duo work in the case to catch Kurt. It's kind of reminiscent of Deb working with Dexter in the books, minus that Deb actually knew Dexter was a killer and Angela doesn't. Also, I really don't want any more eating scenes in this show. The way Harrison eats makes me want to fast for an eternity, man.
It's looking more and more like Deb's right. I may have to kill him. Way to blame Deb, who is actually your conscience, Dex. It's pretty obvious that it's his conscience, since she's gone from guilting him to stop him from killing to tell him to kill Kurt. No accountability for his actions ever, this guy. I don't know why I paused the episode to read Dexter or Jim's text conversation with Angela after Angela kicked Molly out of her office for not telling her she had been at Kurt's cabin. It just went, no, you don't. I was even more boring back then. Yikes, Angela says. Not important. I'm just kind of amused. Maybe I'm just glad the text portrayal is much more, much better than we had to endure at the beginning of Dexter. That stuff straight up looked like some teen was playing in Photoshop or something. I repeat, Angela has been the best cop to exist on this show who isn't named Frank Lundy. Probably because she isn't distracted by dating a fellow cop at the station or whatever drama Miami Metro soap opera of a station was going through that week. I'm having trouble fully liking the idea that Matt had titanium in his legs so Kurt made the connection because titanium doesn't melt. Maybe it's believable, but I would have liked to have at least seen that reference subtly beforehand to make that revelation make us all panic with Dexter. That would have been kind of cool, but whatever. So we went from Robert Hansen references with the way Kurt shoots his victims to an almost green killer-esque parent in Kurt's dad roughing up truck stop sex workers and eventually supposedly killed Iris. The Green River Killer also once had his son around when roughing up his victim. He would also show women a picture of his son to make him seem like a less threatening family man or something. Not a stretch to think Kurt really was influenced by this if it really happened, man. That would probably mess you the heck up. So question, Molly dies in episode 8, 9, or 10, do you think? Right now I'm going to go with 9. We'll see. Great, we finally had our Trinity appearance. We were waiting for that. Kind of underwhelmed, but whatever, makes sense. Great ending to the episode, and I can't wait for next week. I'm still thinking we're on the up and up. Last episode was a little better for me, but I think we're about to set something up for the last act of this show. So, all right, I'm in. Once again, this is Kim in Las Vegas, and join Dexter New Blood. So, you're predicting Molly will die in episode nine. Should we have a little sweepstake and <laughs> place bets now? <laughs> The way Kurt was watching her this week, you could easily read this as him still having intentions on killing her. He could possibly just be looking at her and hating her goddamn guts, <laughs> blaming her for him having to get up, give up his secret kill cabin. A serial killer buried so deeply in his ritual, this really upsets things and he blames her. Will he keep his composure and not have another go at her? Or I wonder if he'll kill her and frame Dexter for it. I love your comment that Angela is the best cop on the show since Lundy. I think LaGuerta showed some intelligence when she uncovered Dexter later on, but I'm a big fan of Lundy, as long-term listeners of the podcast will know. Angela, though, has definitely shown some grit and intellect, and I keep saying this, but she keeps doing it. She follows her gut, and I think this is probably something she did anyway. It's just how she operates. And she doesn't just do it now because of Batista's advice. Thanks very much, Kim. I, I had a couple of messages through Facebook, comments about the podcast itself and this week's episode, this week's Dexter episode. If you wrote to me on there this week, you'll know who you are, and I have to apologize and I can't figure out why, but I can't find the messages anywhere now. They showed up in my Gmail and I read them and I had every intention on of, of reading them out this week, but they've completely vanished. This happened a couple of weeks ago too, and it meant I couldn't read, read out what you'd put. So very sorry if anyone's listening who sent in feedback through Facebook messages direct Facebook messages. Very sorry, <laughs> but thanks very much for getting in touch. Greg Ross from Scunthorpe here in England, actually not a million miles away from where I am uh, actually right now. <laughs> uh, Greg writes, perhaps an unpopular opinion, but while everyone is focusing on Kurt as the so-called big bad 
and the war about to happen between him and Dexter, I can see the final enemy of Dexter being Harrison. Just a theory. Although Dexter believes Harrison could be saved, I fear the darkness could be too deep and perhaps could be a more well-rounded killer than Dexter if he's taught anymore. Therefore, I could see a war between Dexter and Harrison eventually when Dexter realises there's no saving him and he's a danger to himself and society. Thanks, Greg. This is something I've been thinking about more this week. One theory already suggested is that Harrison kills Dexter. Another theory is Dexter killing himself out of shame and the, the devastation, feeling responsible for who his son has become. But it sounds like you're suggesting that Dexter might have to face the possibility of killing Harrison. Whew, bloody hell, that would be dark. <laughs> would they go there? I think they've got the I think they've got the cojones to. <laughs> if they did, where would that leave Dexter? Would he then kill himself? How about he creates a situation that will take both of them out? It's dark stuff. <laughs> It doesn't help this growing sense of doom that's building up in me. Hello, Gareth. Chris here, with my feedback for episode 7 of Dexter New Blood, Skin of Heart Teeth. What a horrible title, when you know what it actually means. The build-up to this episode was slow, but again, like I said last week, very reminiscent of early Dexter with having Dexter in jeopardy and trouble, etc. And I think that's something that we can all agree on, that we enjoy. It was really nice seeing Dexter as a blood splatter analyst Dexter in full-blown scientific geek mode. Um, it was excellent seeing him investigate Iris's body and helping Angela. I found that he was more helpful than he may have been in the past, we often see Dexter hiding things and keeping things to himself, but I feel he was more open this time. The breakfast scene with Dexter and Harrison reminded me of the scene in Jaws when Chief Brody is sitting with his son and he is mimicking him. I know Harrison wasn't mimicking Dexter, but I wonder if it was some sort of small homage to Jaws, or was it just to show us how similar Dexter and Harrison are? Dexter's two biggest mistakes, in my opinion, were not killing Saxton, which ultimately led to Deb's death in season 8, and not killing Trinity in season 4, which led to Rita's death. Will he make that mistake again with Kurt? I don't think so. Seeing Trinity again and hearing him saying, Daddy will be home soon, was truly chilling. Watching season four for me is difficult. Seeing, uh, I know we don't see Rita um, dying, but knowing what happened to her for me is still, is still really hard to watch. And now having this extra scene of the Trinity Killer getting out of the bath and cradling Harrison and saying daddy will be home soon, I think it actually makes that worse, the whole thing worse for me. Harrison remembering everything for me is a bit of a stretch. I'm no expert in child trauma, especially a child as young as Harrison, but it just seems to me that he wouldn't remember. But I'm going to trust you, Gareth, and I'm going to trust the show. Dexter has come to the conclusion that he has to tell Harrison everything. Could this be finally how they bond properly as father and son? I think so. Kurt is proving to be a calculated and smart nemesis for Dexter. The scene in the jail house was very, very good for me and might go down as one of the best head-to-heads in the show's history. It was very intense back and forth. Kurt definitely has some serious daddy issues, that's an understatement. And we get confirmation that he killed Iris via the flashback. Dexter investigating Kurt and straightening the picture, I felt like the camera held on that um, part of the scene for a little bit too long and I feel that might come back into play later. Will Kurt go back into his office and notice that the picture has been straightened and realise that Dexter was there? I think he might. Molly is proving to be smarter than we gave her credit for earlier in the season. She clocked that Dexter perhaps 
or, or not perhaps, but recorded the conversation between her and Kurt. If Angela opens up in any way um, to Molly, um, she will definitely do a deep dive on Dexter. Could we have one final podcast on Dexter by Molly by the end of the show, telling us everything or what she knows that he has done? Could Dexter saving Molly be his actual downfall? The guy who gave Harrison the letter with the screw from Matt was the same guy from the CCTV in the hotel. Not sure if everyone picked up on that. Edward Olsen has been absent again. I believe that's now been for three episodes, potentially four. Is this to make the reveal later on a bit more impactful when he is involved in some way with Kurt? I'm still thinking that will be the case and I'm still holding out that there could be a surprise addition to that. Logan looked sheepish in one of the scenes this week when he had to arrest Kurt. I'm not 100% sold on him being involved, but I wouldn't rule it out either. This episode was great. I think the season has just gone from strength to strength for me, and I'm now in the camp of, I want more. I don't think we're going to get more, but I want more. I don't want a spin-off with Harrison, as much as I think Jack Alcott has done an amazing job as Harrison, I just won't be as interested in continuing the show via a spin-off method. I would like another season, because I feel as if three episodes to go isn't long enough to tie up this story. But we will see. I hope you have a great Christmas, Gareth. I hope you and your family have a lovely time. So Merry Christmas to you and Merry Christmas to my fellow Dissecting Dexter listeners. I'll see you in another life, brother. Thanks, Chris. Merry Christmas to you and your family too. Good catch about the opening scene. Dexter often used to hold things back from his analysis at a crime scene. This time, he didn't really have any need to, and indeed, he will have probably thought of this as a chance to start to get back into Angela's good graces. Thanks for going into detail about the Trinity flashback. I was, um, I was guilty of not digging into it as much as I could in my review, and I apologise for that. I should have done, because it's big, isn't it? Having everyone, well, for many people, he's the number one big bad of all time. For Dexter and I should have dug into it a bit more. I was remiss but let's talk about it a little bit now. You give a good perspective on it. Season 4 is hard to re-watch knowing what's coming. I've described the ending of season 4, the image of Harrison in the blood, as one of my two biggest shock moments in TV. Ones that left me feeling almost ill from horror. The other being the Red Wedding in Game of Thrones. However, I'm invested far more emotionally in Dexter. In no small part to doing the podcast. We never saw Rita's murder and can only imagine from what we'd been shown earlier in the season. But having that little flashback this week and knowing Harrison was probably sitting there the whole time on the bathroom floor as the blood started to pool around him and that despicable faux reassurance from Trinity, Daddy will be home soon. You're right, it really makes this all the more stomach churning and disturbing. This is Harrison's memory, certainly as it's being presented by the show, obviously we can talk about the, the scientific evidence and whether people can have vivid memories from such a young age. But within the show, within the canon of the show, this is Harrison's memory and it directly connects his dad with his mum's murder. It also perhaps implies that Trinity knew him. If Dexter's thinking about telling Harrison everything, I don't think he should tell him the full story or Harrison will blame Dexter for Rita and Deb too. And worse still, of course, he'd be right. Both were his fault. And that was a fair point about Molly. Dexter saving her could be his ultimate undoing. And we will be getting uh, an episode of the Merry Fucking Kill podcast dedicated to Dexter Morgan sometime after New Blood ends, sometime later in January. That would be a cherry on the top, but not one I would necessarily look forward to. 
Actually, just thinking about the the pooling blood on the bathroom floor, I liked the the visuals accompanying the end of episode credits, with the uh, the blood dripping out of the bath and uh, across the across the the tiled floor. That was that was good design. Well done. <laughs> Thanks again, Chris. On to an email now from Mike Lanich. Another week, another good episode of Dexter. While I continue to have some quibbles here and there, I do feel like the show has been gathering steam these past few weeks, starting with H is for Hero. First, the good stuff. Seeing Dexter in his blood spatter analyst mode was great yet again. I feel like he actually loved his job and it's a piece missing from him, an aspect of his life he doesn't reflect on enough. Angela and Molly beginning to confide in one another about Dexter made me excited. It's going to be interesting to see how this plays out because knowing it's Dexter doesn't really mean much unless she can actually tie him to the Bay Harbour butcher bodies and right now she doesn't seem to have a reason to even suspect him. So it turns out that Kurt has been on to Dexter since the end of episode 3. It's a nice twist but it makes me wonder how Kurt knows it was him. If I remember correctly, Dexter picked Kurt up on his way through town, but I don't see how that would connect Dexter specifically to Matt's death. Plus, if this incinerator shoots out this snow-like mess any time something gets thrown in there, wouldn't this be common? It's a working incinerator with seemingly zero cameras or a functional fence. How much trash and other stuff gets thrown in there on a weekly basis at night? It's weird that Kurt was just let go, too. Wouldn't they be able to test it to see if it really is his DNA and not his father's? Also, Dexter and Angela could provide evidence of what was in the cabin and how it's suddenly not there. And the fact that he lied about a call from his son. Wouldn't that be obstructing an investigation? Another thought. Is it possible that the drone gave Harrison, that Kurt gave Harrison, could that be bugged? Maybe he's been listening in on every conversation Dexter and Harrison have, or Dexter has with himself. I don't think Harrison took it out of the box yet. Speaking of Harrison, I have to be honest, this is the first episode that I have been specifically annoyed at his character. The way he was defensive with everyone really started to grate on me. Audrey may understand he has some darkness and relate on some level, but I can easily see why she would be unnerved over Harrison breaking that kid's arm for no reason, and yet Harrison is the one being passive-aggressive. With Dexter, I understand the attitude, given how much unresolved history lay between them, but I feel they're like this is maybe a step too far. I loved seeing John Lithgow back as Trinity, but would Harrison be old enough to remember anything? Didn't they resolve that question in season five? Harrison couldn't have been more than a year old when Rita died. All of that aside, though, I feel like we are cruising now towards the end. But the end of what? They need to tie up the battle between Kurt and Dexter, resolve this relationship with Harrison, and given how they made it a point to have Molly say that she doesn't believe Dokes was the Bay Harbour Butcher, out Dexter as the true Bay Harbour Butcher. It seems hard to believe that they can do all this, plus resolve any other ancillary storylines in just three episodes and wrap a tidy bow on Dexter as a character. I'm excited to see what happens, though. Thanks, Mike, and thanks again for coming on last week. Firstly, I think I said in my review earlier that it was episode two when Kurt latched onto Dexter. You're right, it was the end of episode three when Dexter burned the body. Sorry about the mistake. Episode three it was. I'm glad you enjoyed that opening scene. You're right, it was something that Dexter got a lot of, a lot out of, back in Miami, analysing crime scenes. It was something that got him excited, something he enjoyed doing, it got his juices flowing. A voiceover comment this week, something like, I miss doing this. Might have been good here, might have been fun. Kurt getting on to Dexter. I think it was maybe a process, putting things together, Perhaps we should give Kurt credit for his intelligence in doing so. Maybe he was following his own gut feeling in checking the incinerator. Perhaps he didn't do it right away, but went back a day or two later after something else got him thinking. The CCTV, maybe. Oh, sorry, I mentioned it again. <laughs> for the DNA, 
they did test to see if it was Kurtz and got a 67% probability. They had a sample of his DNA from earlier in the series that they could test against. Dexter and Molly could be witness to what was in the room before Kurt cleared it out. Kurt could provide a BS excuse and it's all just circumstantial without anything concrete. They could maybe get him for lying about his son and hampering an investigation, but without a body, I don't think there's a crime at the moment, is there? It's all just hinky enough for Angela to know something fishy's going on, but she can't prove anything at the moment. Harrison, I can understand your irritation. He was pretty immature with his response to Audrey. Did he honestly expect her to be okay with what he did? He didn't even try to explain himself, just went like, Oh, well, I'm so busy, I'll see you whenever. <laughs> but someone in his position might reasonably be expected to be emotionally dysregulated sometimes and react irrationally or unreasonably. It's not uncommon. Thanks again, Mike. Here we go with a voicemail from Nick Henderson. Hey, Gareth, Nick here. Skin Over Teeth, Episode 7. Didn't have quite the same impact on me as last week, but it was still a really strong episode. Uh, lots of great classic Dexter elements to chew on. In fact, I would say this episode was perhaps the most nostalgic of the lot so far. Aside from the obvious big reason, we also got some good old-fashioned detective work in that opening scene, which was a ton of fun, and the cat and mouse between Dexter and Kurt is officially underway. So that's really exciting. With that said, I think the highlight of the episode for me was Dexter helping Angela with the investigation. Not necessarily just the cave scene, which was fantastic, uh, but also choosing to take her out to the cabin where they find the room that's been completely stripped. It's a great example of how far Dexter has come as a character. The Dexter of old would never have assisted an investigation like this. It just shows that despite falling off the wagon, his priorities appear to be in the right place as a human being, so that's good. I also really love... Um, in the cave scene, before he goes to actually start um, examining the body, he asks Angela for permission, which, again, felt distinctly new Dexter, and I really like that. I also love to see them using some of Dexter's sloppiness against him this season. Um, Molly was quick to point out the holes in Dexter's story about overhearing her and Kurt at the bar, and the titanium bolt from Matt's leg was a nice and cryptic taunt from Kurt, so that was really cool. There's obviously still some nitpicks to be had, but I don't really find them to be all that important personally because I think the underlying story they're telling here is coming together really nicely and the character work, which I think is the important thing, is fantastic. Of course, I love seeing Lithgow at the end. That was fantastic. That man hasn't aged a day um, and he slipped right back into that ultra creepy delivery with, with ease. It was actually kind of creepy in and of itself. Um, I'm not sure if this is the only bit we're going to see of him on the show, though it probably is, but... It was a really well done cameo, so bravo. And finally, on a quick note, um, I think I'm officially letting go of my Logan theory that I mentioned uh, the past couple weeks. He seemed legit this week in his interactions with Kurt. Also, I don't think I've heard anyone point this out yet, so I'm going to mention it here. I was actually talking to John at DexterDaily.com this week, and he pointed out that the words New Blood in the title sequence are gradually filling up with blood more and more with each episode. If you ask me, consider this more mounting evidence that Showtime is preparing to announce the spinoff after this season ends. Um, from the beginning, the word Dexter is barely filled with blood, which might also allude to the fact that Dexter's journey is almost over. Either way, I'm loving the way this season is coming together. I can't wait to hear from everyone else, obviously, on the show. So, um, until next week, cheers. Thanks, Nick. Some good observations there. We've mentioned the logo, getting more bloody each week. It's a nice touch, very nice. In fact, this whole series has been the, the production design, the visual design, the sound design, it's all been great, great production values. The animated show Invincible, I think it, you can see it on Amazon Prime, it did something similar with, with its own title card last year. Unlike you, I think it has meaning for where the show is heading. Whether there's a spin-off, we'll see but it really doesn't help my peace of mind about where Dexter will end up in three weeks' time. Okay, email now from Luke Farmer in Essex. He writes, I wasn't sure what to make of this one, to be honest. I won't be too harsh until I've rewatched, but my initial thoughts were, the, were that this is one of the poorer New Blood episodes. Oh dear. <laughs> 
He says, overall, it felt disjointed and we jumped between various subplots without much cohesion. I don't think this was helped by a number of the flashbacks, by the number of flashbacks throughout. On the flashbacks, I'm not sure I understand the purpose of the ones with Kurt, either as a child or as a younger man. There didn't seem to be any rationale for him shooting Iris other than him being annoy annoyed that she got out of the truck. How has that led to his current day ritual with the motel room, the draining of the blood, etc? I've been looking forward to seeing how Trinity would feature in New Blood, but I was a bit disappointed with his cameo. I thought he looked much older than in season four, which is to be expected, but he was more a frail pensioner than terrifying serial killer. It didn't really seem to add anything either. Harrison saying he remembers what happened, which I have to say I'm sceptical about, with snapshots of Rita in the bath or even Dexter carrying him out would have worked better, in my opinion. Perhaps he'll feature again, but if not, he was shoehorned in a bit. Shame for such an iconic character. Mind you, the same could be said for Angel. He doesn't seem to be coming back. This is a very small moan, and it might just be me, but the whole Harrison eats a bit like Dexter feels OTT now. We've had quite a few shots of Harrison chomping away. Surely we don't need any more. There were some good bits, though. I don't want to sound too negative. It was great to see more of Dexter Morgan, forensics expert, and he clearly still has the knack for it. I also liked how he toyed with Kurt throughout the episode, winding him up, reminiscent of some of the classic Dexter vs. Big Bad showdowns. The final scene was a bit of a head-scratcher, though. I'm surprised that Dexter didn't spot that odd-looking trucker bloke creeping up on him, and I can't help but think that he'd have had no problem in dealing with him. The Dexter of old would have had him in a sleeper hold in two seconds flat. Perhaps he's still showing some ring rust. I'm assuming that, De that Harrison is going to play a big part in either helping Dexter get free or perhaps sealing his fate and siding with Kurt. Time will tell, but if Dexter is finally taken down after all these years at the hands of Kurt and his strange mate, I will feel disappointed. I'm not scared by Kurt, to be honest. Three episodes to go and lots to unravel. If this is the final Dexter series, I think the ending is going to be very hectic. Hopefully the writers don't just conclude this series, but wrap up the whole show. Better yet, hopefully this is just the beginning. Thanks, Luke. As you'll have heard, I think there is still more to learn about how Kurt evolved as a killer. Him killing Iris seems spontaneous and pointless. Perhaps something just snapped in him. Hopefully nothing to do with the runaway song, like he thought, Oh, she's running away. Wait, run away. My dad used to hurt women while I played this song. Let's shoot this one. Bang. <laughs> I'm sure it wasn't like that. But like I said, I wasn't really clear from the actor's performance what was going through his mind there. Maybe we're meant to wonder and they'll give us more later. That last scene, not spotting the scruffy bloke near his car, I can only suggest that he wasn't paying attention with what had just happened and was caught off guard. You're not the first to point out with how little time we've got left and how much we've still got to wrap up. These last two or three episodes are going to be pretty hectic. But they could also be really exciting and fast paced as well. So it may not be it may not be to the show's detriment that there's so much still to to cover. Hello. And welcome to the Dexter New Blood Correspondence Writing Program. If you are listening to this audio cassette tape, then you are one of the writers for the Showtime Limited Event series Dexter New Blood. If you are not one of the writers for the series, please turn off this audio cassette tape now and contact CBS Confidential Asset Acquisitions at 51 West 52nd Street, New York, New York, 10019, care of Les Moonbez, who is now working in the mailroom after being exposed as a sex pervert. Due to continuing COVID-19 developments and restrictions, this limited event series will be entirely written remotely 
with correspondence by way of a series of pre-recorded audio cassette tapes from executive producer for Dexter New Blood, Clyde Phillips. In just a moment, you will hear the voice of Clyde Phillips as he gives directions to you on how to write various scenes for Dexter and all of his friends in Iron Lake. As always, the wisdom Mr. Phillips imparts comes from his years of experience as a television writer, and this information should be kept confidential, under threat of termination of your position in the writing program, severe legal action, and being demoted to personal assistant to Les Moonves. Without further ado, here is Mr. Clyde Phillips with some guidance on how to write scenes for Dexter New Blood. Hello everyone, this is Clyde Phillips, executive producer for Dexter New Blood, a Showtime limited event series, blah blah blah. This is tape 7 or 8, I forget which. Uh, on our last tape, we talked about crime and punishment in our show. To recap, Harrison's not going to get suspended, and he's still going to be on the wrestling team even after he breaks that boy's elbow. And Angela will not be able to hold Kurt for any crimes, even with video evidence and an admission of obstruction of justice. And never mind that Scott Peterson was held and later convicted for murder with zero DNA evidence against him. For this week's tape, we're going to keep it short. I'm going to talk to you about how you write any scene that takes place between Harrison and his dad, Dexter. I say we're going to keep it short because that's how those scenes should be. Short, with a capital SH. Remember, the theme of this whole season is fathers and sons. And we can't have our main father and son actually having too much screen time together or having real conversations you'd expect real people to actually have. Now trust me, I'm the man who made Parker Lewis Can't Lose the television sitcom. I know what I'm talking about when I say we need to artificially delay the resolution to the story. Because if Dexter and Harrison just talked, the show would be over, and I'd be back working for my sister's no-good husband behind the deli counter Schmedricks. And let me tell you, like letting Deb have an appropriate boyfriend, I cannot let that happen. So here's your basic skeleton for any scene involving Dexter and Harrison. Harrison comes in. Dexter says something. Harrison gets offended, and he says, Really, Jim? He puts on his blue coat, and he storms off to somewhere. Dexter will never chase him down, and Dexter will never attempt to clarify anything he was trying to say. End of scene. This may sound restricting, but that couldn't be further from the truth. You can add all sorts of unique spins and angles to this kind of formula. Sometimes Harrison could be leaving for school, or he's on his way back from school. Or sometimes... He's going to wrestling practice, or he's going to work. Sometimes the scene even takes place at Harrison's work. Sometimes there's uneaten food involved, and sometimes you can even have them at a therapist's office. But we only hide the therapist actor for the afternoon, so we're only ever going to do that scene once, and we're never going to talk about the therapist again. So that's it for this tape. Let's recap. Harrison comes in. Dexter talks. Harrison gets mad. Harrison leaves. Again, you're going to need to trust me on this one. It's not like I've ever won an Emmy, but I've seen the ceremony many times on my color TV. It seems nice. I hear they got catering from Schmendrix. They never invite people from the mailroom, so ladies, you can relax for the evening. Next up, we're going to talk about the character of Audrey. She's pretty and popular and gets invited to drug parties. And she has a small army of climate activists at her command. But remember, she's a loner and an outsider, and nobody likes her. She gets hot and horny for Harrison when he says he wants to hurt everybody, but when he actually does it, she's completely in the right to act like that behavior came from out of nowhere, and she's shocked that he's a secret asshole. Please turn your audio cassette tape over to side B now. Wow! I can't believe we managed to get that on air. Where did this come from? An inside leak? Clyde Phillips! Clyde Phillips himself there! <laughs> So, these scenes between Dexter and Harrison are intentionally short and often frustrating. Actually, the best dialogue between them was the longer scene with the therapist, and Clyde's right. What happened to that? Since it's the only time they've said more than a couple of sentences to each other, I'd love to have more of that, and I hope we get it. There's so much we want to hear them talk about, isn't there? It's fair to say that if they'd talked to if they'd talked it all out at the start, there wouldn't be the same ongoing tension and Harrison would quite possibly not be drawn to Kurt in the same way, if at all. For dramatic writing, though, <laughs> because this is a, a drama series, isn't it? We understand that writers have to take some liberties and, and where in real life an issue could be resolved in a single conversation. We need dramatic tension and jeopardy, so things need to be drawn out. I'm not 
a dramatic writer, <laughs> but how often do we catch, do we watch stuff and say, oh, that wouldn't happen in real life. That wouldn't be how it would happen in real life. That said, though, I really do wish we would have had more of Dexter and Harrison talking about stuff. Example, they, they could have had a chat about Astor and Cody without threatening the main thrust of the plot. As for Audrey, perhaps she was kidding herself, calling herself an outsider like Harrison. Because of her heritage, you can perhaps see how she might feel like this, but socially, all evidence suggests that she's popular and has lots of friends, unlike Harrison, who's new to the place and is only popular, arguably, because people think he prevented a tragedy at the school. We could have had a scene this week with Logan or the school principal discussing consequences for breaking the arm. There'll, there'll always be some frustrations with our favourite shows and Dexter's not immune to that. Personally, I'm enjoying the ride and I can let a lot of things slide. The poor communication with Harrison is a frustrating one though for many of us. But although I think that we should remember that neither of them are a socially adept, certain conversation topics really should be in the forefront of their minds. Thanks, Travis. You put my own production values to shame and I, I really do appreciate, as I'm sure we all do, we appreciate the effort you've been putting into these. Great work, my friend. Great work. Okay, so that's it for this week. Well, we've got three episodes left. I think there's, um, we've got plenty of ups and downs still to come. And as I say, I am fearful for Dexter and, and where, where we're going to leave him when episode 10 concludes. Wow. Well, of course, it's Christmas this weekend and... I do sincerely wish each and every one of you a very, very happy Christmas. And uh, if you don't celebrate Christmas, then enjoy the holidays, enjoy the break. Next week, of course, it's Christmas week. I have family stuff. I have some work stuff going on as well. So um, the podcast might end up being uh, towards the end of the week again. Uh, so apologies in advance if you're holding out for um, for dissecting Dexter. It will be along just as as soon as uh, as soon as I can. But until then, until next week, when we will definitely be dissecting some more Dexter. Thanks for everyone for your support and for listening, particularly of course to uh, my Patreon supporters. Merry Christmas, everyone! Thank you for listening. Take care, and I'll speak to you soon. Bye for now.